Good morning. Before we begin, let's get oriented to the webinar room. In the corner of your screen, you'll find the chat box, which you can use to share your comments with us. Feel free to submit your comments at any time, but please save your questions for our presenters for the Q&A at the end of the session. Of course, the more participants we have, the livelier our discussion will be. I'd like to encourage everyone to participate. Today's webinar will also be recorded, and the video will be uploaded onto our website, hireimmigrants.org, along with any related resources. Please make sure to share the link with your colleagues and network. So it's 11 o'clock, so we're going to get started. Good afternoon and good morning, depending on your time zone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. Our topic today is a priority issue not just for our employers or government, but also for everyone interested and committed to the successful integration of newcomers and refugees into our society. My name is Devin Franklin, and I'm the project manager of Higher Immigrants. It's my pleasure to host today's webinar. Based at Ryerson University in Toronto, the Higher Immigrants Program provides a platform for employers and stakeholders, both for-profit and non-profit, to find and share practical solutions for the types of challenges we'll be talking about today. Sponsoring today's webinar is the Ontario Government, which has been a valuable public sector partner that's committed to finding solutions to the integration and employment challenges faced by newcomers and immigrants. Employment and labor market attachment have always been linked to the immigration experience in one way or another through issues related to their integration and social mobility. For many refugees and newcomers, the challenge of finding employment opportunities stands in the way of attaining full social mobility and long-term integration in a new society. With many immigrant receiving nations trying to cope with impending and foreseeable labor market shortages, and as the global refugee crisis continues to grow, it's imperative that we start to provide practical and replicable solutions. In today's increasingly interconnected global economy, many employers are looking beyond their borders for skills and talent to fill their skills and labor market needs and shortages. Innovative HR solutions are the way forward for many employers and industries that want to remain relevant and thrive. Linking the global market to top refugee talent from around the world is one way to provide employers with a new talent pipeline that meets business needs while strengthening private sector engagement in the global refugee crisis. Talking to subject matter experts and innovative employers is a good start to learn about private-public partnerships, how it works, and how it can be replicated in other industries. Joining us today are two experts that will share their refugee talent hiring model. I'd like to introduce Sarah Nice, nice sorry, is the Executive Director of Talent Beyond Boundaries, TBB, and has worked to improve refugee policy and response in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and has extensive experience conducting field analysis, building consensus among varieties of stakeholders, and increasing operational effectiveness. Abigail Fulton is the Executive Director of the Construction Foundation of BC, CSBC, and Vice President of the British Columbia Construction Association, BCCA. Abigail works with industry and government on regulatory and policy issues impacting the construction industry. She currently leads the BCCA Foreign Skilled Worker BC Initiative and works to bring in foreign trained qualified tradespeople to BC as well as the BCCA Integrating Newcomer Program that helps new immigrants find employment in BC prior to landing in Canada. A quick word about who else is in the virtual room. We're a diverse group. A great number of us are employers, civil servants, service providers, and professionals in the field of immigration and employment. We've got a mixed audience today. Some are Canadian, and others are joining us from abroad. Welcome to our Canadian participants, some returning and some new, and welcome to our international colleagues. Now we'll first hear briefly from each of our presenters, followed by a moderated conversation, and then we'll open it up to questions from participants. OK, let's begin with the creation of a refugee talent pipeline. Sarah, start by telling us a bit about Talent Beyond Boundaries and how the talent portal works. So thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Um, briefly about Talent Beyond Boundaries. We are a nonprofit organization. Our headquarters are in Washington, D.C., and we started this work in 2015. 
Um, our goal is to connect the private sector to the hidden talent pool of refugees. So these are refugees who are unable to work legally in the countries they're currently living, um, but they could fill skill gaps in different parts of the world. So currently, we're still the only organization focused on developing this labor mobility pathway for refugees uh, to regain their self-reliance through private sector global employment across borders. And we're really hoping to be a catalyst in this effort. Um, so we're helping businesses fill their talent gaps, and at the same time, we are contributing to the solutions for the refugee crisis by developing this pathway for refugees to move as part of the global labor market on uh, legal work visas or permanent residence. Um, so just the scale of this humanitarian crisis is enormous, as you know. Over 65 million people displaced due to conflict, and that doesn't even include those displaced by natural disasters or, or global warming. Um, now you have about 20, 20 plus million refugees who've crossed an international border, but living in countries where they can't fully integrate or work legally. So we at Talent Beyond Boundaries are focusing on the Syria crisis first. There's about 5 million Syrian refugees. And we started there um, because they have very limited opportunities to provide for themselves to work. And there's just so many talented people among this ref refugee population um, who are excited to, to find work opportunities abroad where they can use their skills and talents. Um, in terms of different pathways for refugees, in the last few years, the global community, including the UN and governments and private citizens, they started rallying for around the need for new solutions, new commitments to this refugee crisis. So at Talent Beyond Boundaries, we're doing exactly that by proposing labor mobility for refugees who can fill skill gaps in countries, regions around the world where their talents are needed. Um, so in terms of the global skill gaps and that challenge, um, there was a study uh, in 2015 among 42,000 employers globally, uh, and 38% of them said they had trouble fill, filling jobs. We just looked at the 2016 study, and now it's 40% of employers that can't find the talent that they need. Um, so, of course, this impact is felt by businesses. Um, but it also affects economic growth, of course. Um, the Boston Consulting Group, they've reported that the world will lose about 10 trillion U.S. dollars in GDP by 2030 uh, because of this global labor imbalance. Um, but we see that businesses can turn to refugees to fill some of these skill gaps. So our solution is for refugees who are an untapped talent pool um, they can be a creative solution to hiring needs. So many refugees, uh, including those in Canada, came through the resettlement pathway. Um, those are the most vulnerable people. They might not always have the skills and the experience and language ability that's needed to, to fit the needs of the companies in the places where they've been resettled. Um, of course, resettlement is extremely important, but there are millions of refugees with talents and skills who wouldn't qualify for resettlement and need other options. So we're working with those refugees to have them identify their talents and experience that the businesses have expressed that they need. Um, many of those refu refugees would not be resettled, so we're really focused on these skilled immigration pathways. Our, our pilot project is in Jordan and Lebanon with refugees living there who can't work legally. And we found that among that population, many of them had skilled jobs, advanced training, specialized work experience. This includes engineers and, and IT and tech professionals, healthcare providers, uh, skilled tradespeople, teachers, um, many, many more. So right now, we are at about 6,000 candidates in our online talent catalog, and it's growing daily. About 30% of them report higher education, 30% report that they have some English language skills. And now we're meeting with these refugees face-to-face -face in Lebanon and Jordan to talk to them about our, our talent catalog. Um, I'll give you a quote from, from one refugee we spoke with named Tarek. He's an electrical engineer, and he told us, I'm very interested in going abroad to work in my field. I don't want to take money from humanitarian organizations. I want to work. I want to continue to develop myself and my skills. Life deserves to be lived. 
So we are hoping to provide this solution that addresses both the refugee and the skill gap problems and provides another solution or pathway for refugees to become self-reliant. So why has no one accessed this solution? Um, as you can imagine, there are, of course, barriers that keep companies from accessing this talent pool. And from our experience, um, the companies are ready to accept this, that you know, these refugees have skills and talents, qualifications, but there are barriers such as information. Companies don't always know how to find the talent among refugee populations. Maybe the refugees don't know how to access the opportunities. Um, travel documents can be a challenge. Many of the refugees we've spoken with, worked with, often have had a passport, but it needs to be renewed, which is expensive. Sometimes um, they don't have the language skills, or they can't verify those language skills. Or, for example, they might not have their education diplomas or their skills certificates because they left them at home when they fled to another country. So what we're doing is to ad we're addressing these barriers through our pilot project. Um, the information barrier that I mentioned, that was one of the largest challenges. So we needed the data. We wanted to be able to demonstrate to the private sector employers that there are refugees with skills, education, work experience that might meet their, their needs. Um, we couldn't find the detailed data that companies would need, so we started collecting it from refugees in this first-of-its-kind online talent catalog. We built this portal. It was actually developed by a Syrian refugee that we met in Beirut in 2015. And in this online talent catalog, refugees can fill in information about their work experience and language abilities, skills, education. And then we use that data to present um, information to employers, and we facilitate that connection between a company and uh, the talent. Um, right now, we are working in partnership with the UN Refugee Agency, uh, UNHCR. Uh, they can provide guidance uh, on how to address some of the other barriers like travel documents, for example, other required documentation. Um, we found that the companies themselves will do a lot of the skills verification through the interview process, which will, of course, facilitate. Um, and then for one of the other barriers I mentioned for validating education, we can ask the refugees to submit their academic materials to World Education Services, WES, um, which is based in Canada, and they can help verify education. In fact, they're currently doing a pilot with refugees already in Canada to verify credentials, even if the refugees are missing documentation. And they have quite a rigorous academic reconstruction process. So, and finally, on the, on the language abilities, um, we have various partnerships to help, re help refugees strengthen their English language skills, and then we'll verify their skills through the IELTS test, um, the International Language Exam. So just a little bit more about our pilot project. So we're working, as I mentioned, with refugees in Lebanon and Jordan, and we're exploring placements in different parts of the world. Um, we're not trying to connect refugees with jobs in the US or Europe right now, but we're exploring placements in North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, and areas of Canada and Australia. Um, in Canada uh, and other places, when refugees arrive, not through resettlement, but they, they arrive through skilled immigration pathways and immediately can start working um, and become permanent residents. Uh, in Canada specifically, we are exploring the express entry and the provincial nominee program. Um, basically what we're doing, it's a market-based approach that helps businesses grow, and it, it also provides an avenue for companies to get involved in in the solution. Um, many of them want to contribute to the global refugee crisis and while also finding candidates for hard to fill jobs. So just a little bit about our corporate partnerships. They are critical to our work. Um, we're working with industry associations that can help small and medium-sized uh, businesses bring in talent when they don't necessarily have the human resources capacities to recruit from abroad. We have three corporate partnerships. Um, you'll hear from Abigail with the Construction Foundation of British Columbia. Um, we're working with them to identify engineers with construction experience. We're also working with the Information and Communication 
Technology Council, ICTC in Canada, to find tech professionals. And finally, in Australia, we're working with a company called Cameron Edge to identify PHP developers. Um, just how we work with these companies, we are committed to working with them through every step of the process. Um, we work with both the company and the refugee on first, you know, with the companies identifying what their hiring needs are. We find their potential candidates. We facilitate the interviews. We'll do the language testing. And we'll guide basically the refugees and the companies through the whole process until the refugee arrives on the ground and starts working. Um, so this is a solution that benefits many, uh, refugees, businesses, and more. Um, for the businesses, of course, they get qualified talent uh, for jobs. And for countries that are receiving the refugees, such as Canada, you're bringing in skilled talent to fill labor gaps. Um, in addition, if, if refugees are leaving the countries that they're currently hosted in, such as Lebanon and Jordan, then the humanitarian organizations in those countries and those governments can focus their limited resources on helping the most vulnerable refugees, while the ones we're working with are moving abroad and regaining their self-reliance. Finally, of course, you know, for the refugees, when they're employed internationally, you know, they can continue to enhance their careers and, and regain an income and provide for their families. And just a few things I wanted to mention to the audience there. There are definitely ways you could get involved. Um, if you're an employer, for example, you can see in the next slide here, I think I've gone through some of those um, immigration processes that we focus on in our work and the beneficiaries. And I just want to finalize by talking about the ways you can get involved. So, if you're an employer, we would love to talk with you. You could look into our talent pool and our talent catalog and see if there are any candidates um, that we can identify for you that might fill your hiring needs. Of course, if you would be interested in, in reviewing CVs, we'd definitely appreciate that if you have subject matter expertise in tech, engineering, accounting, et cetera. Um, we're looking for help with interview preparation. Certainly, if some of you have immigration advice, uh, the immigration pathways, the details are always changing about how those work. So we love experts who have knowledge about express entry or the provincial nominee programs. Or even if you have you know, labor market analysis, information about skill gaps in Canada or, or other countries, we'd love to hear from you. So please keep in mind, feel free to, to reach out to us at any time. On this last page, you can see our, our website information. Um, our corporate outreach associate, Rachel Laurie, and myself were always interested in hearing from you. So thank you, thank you for listening, and I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Thank you, Sarah. It was really useful to get an overview of TBB and the employment and settlement pathways that it is creating for refugees. I'm sure our audience has many questions for you, and so please share them with us during your Q&A session. Now let's shift to Abigail and hear about how TVB's innovative HR solution is operationalized in the construction industry. Abigail, tell us a bit about CFBC's practice of facilitating refugees into employment and your partnership with TVD. Absolutely, and good morning from beautiful British Columbia. It's a, a lovely day here, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here on this webinar and sharing some of the information that, that we've developed over the years. And I'd like to start off with a big shout out to Talent Beyond Boundaries who are doing what I think is an amazing job. And I strongly recommend anybody out there who is an employer or who works with employers to connect with them and, and, and talk about their skilled uh, workforce that they're developing. So uh, the Construction Foundation, I should say I wear two hats. Um, I'm the Vice President of the BC Construction Association and the Executive Director of the Construction Foundation of BC. Um, we're the charitable arm. The, the foundation is the charitable arm of BCCA, and BCCA represents four regional associations um, that are situated across British Columbia. So we have um, a pretty good uh, reach throughout the province. We're in on the island, we're in the lower mainland, we're in the north, and we're in the interior. So our connections to employers are vast. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, nope, moving on, moving on. I'm going fast here. So I want to tell you a little about uh, the labor market currently in British Columbia. Um, it's been pretty hot over the last decade, um, mostly lately with industrial, but also commercial and residential construction. Um, the problems we're having in BC are related to filling job openings. Um, we have, in addition to pretty hot construction market, we have a lot of people retiring and, a lot, and not enough youth entering uh, the, the uh, marketplace. So statistically, currently we have about $81 billion underway in construction projects in BC with uh, an anticipation we're anticipating about $296 billion over the next few years. Now, may happen, it may not happen. If we don't find the skilled workers, it most certainly will not happen. Uh, it's estimated right now uh, through BuildForce, which is really good labor market information. If anybody's looking uh, for labor market information across Canada in the industry, go to BuildForce. Um, they're estimating about 50,000 job openings by 2024. So that's Significant. Uh, keep in mind that two out of three workers in, in BC, particularly in the skilled trades, are already over the age of 45. So a lot of people are going to be retiring. Um, and because of this, and because of the fact that, that youth aren't going into apprenticeships as much as we would like to see, um, we anticipate that at least 25,000 of those job openings are going to go unfilled. And we need to look to immigration to fill those jobs. The employers in the industry are typically small. Um, so you know th there's a broad range. Obviously, there's some very large employers uh, that are multinational. But typically, uh, employers in the industry have fewer than 10 employees. So very difficult for them when they're looking to fill their job openings to understand how to go offshore or to find anybody who isn't down the street. Um, so there's some challenges uh, filling the job openings that are going to be happening. Uh, next slide, please. So these job opportunities, and I'm not going to name them all, uh, suffice it to say they're across the board. Um, first and always foremost are trades. Um, we're always looking for good tradespeople, qualified tradespeople. Um, but we also need professionals. Uh, and all the support occupations. So often when working with folks who are coming in from offshore, they may not think that their skill sets are perfect for the construction industry, but the reality is there's probably a place for them somewhere in the industry. It isn't necessarily on the tools. Next slide, please. So the BC Construction Association has a number of programs. Um, and the reason I'm involved in this is because of my work with those programs. We have a, a skilled trades employment program that's funded through the provincial government that's specific to getting uh, British, Columbia's, British Columbians work in the industry. We've been running that program for well over a decade. And as a result, uh, we have massive contact with employers across the industry, not just our members, but the entire industry. Um, we also have a foreign skilled worker program that we've been managing since about 2005. This is a program that's funded through employers. Um, and it, what we do is we recruit workers offshore for all these companies who can't afford to do it themselves or, or don't know how to do it. We go offshore. We find the workers. We connect them with the employers. Um, we help the individuals with the immigration process if they're offered a job. Um, and it's worked tremendously well, it, particularly in times of, of real panic when employers can't find Canadians to fill jobs. We've been able to do that recruiting and help make those connections and do the immigration work. Finally, we have a program that's funded by IRCC, the federal government. Um, and it enables us to work with folks who've been approved for a permanent residency. Um, we work with them offshore. And we help connect them with employment prior to them landing in BC. So because of these programs, I have a pretty broad uh, experience working with folks offshore. Next slide, please. Um, in the summer, the foundation did a bit of a research project. As you're probably aware, we've had quite a few uh, Syrian refugees that have come into British Columbia in the past year. And we took a look at who was coming in and tried to figure out if there was a connection there for the construction industry. Of the folks that have come in so far, uh, typically 
English is the challenge. Uh, most of them don't speak good English. Uh, they definitely need work uh, with their English skills. But a significant number of them have had a background in the construction industry. And so we knew that there was an opportunity there. Next slide, please. We, so we, ha we knew we had a, a workforce that had come into the province that had a background working on some level of construction, um, but, but they couldn't speak English. And we thought, OK, is there a way that we can get these folks a job in our industry because we're looking for workers? How can we do this? So we decided, well, what about if we hired four or five at once on a, in a, a pod, we called them, if we could find one individual who was bilingual, who could speak Arabic uh, as well as English, could we hire them all as a group? And we tested it in the lower mainland, and lo and behold, it worked. Um, we, we discovered we, we had an individual uh, working for us who, who spoke Arabic, and he went out, met the Syrians, and, and started identifying these pods. We would find one individual who could speak English, We'd link them with uh, several who couldn't, and we'd get them hired as a group uh, with a contractor in the lower main lab. So we knew that that would work. The challenge was finding enough bilingual supervisors. Next slide, please. So enter Talent Beyond Boundaries. Uh, we recognized, we were lucky enough to get connected with them, and we recognized they had this skill set, or this uh, talent pool that they were developing. Um, pretty much solid English abilities. So they're bilingual. They have backgrounds in construction. Uh, if we, we knew if we could get them into the country and connect them up with an employer, we could not only get them employed, uh, but then we could turn around and place more uh, refugees on the job site as well. So we figured it would be a really good win-win for everybody if we could make this happen. Next slide, please. So we've just started. It's early days. We're working with Talent Beyond Boundaries to identify initial folks that we're going to uh, hopefully get in through uh, the immigration process. Obviously, immigration, the, the process itself is the biggest challenge for us. Um, if we can get them into uh, the process and find an employer to match them with, um, we believe we've got a model that could be really effective, not just for those folks offshore and for the employers who need skilled workers, but also to help the refugees that are here right now. So you know, I could go on on this topic for a long time, but I think I'm probably uh, extending my, my talk further than I should. So I'm going to be quiet now and take some questions. I really look forward to um, any questions that you folks have. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail, for sharing the Construction Foundation of British Columbia's forward-thinking approach, particularly in regards to solving the labor market shortage in the construction industry by providing employment opportunities to refugees and newcomers. The partnership between the two organizations we've just heard from is an innovative model that I'm sure many will be looking to replicate. I encourage your participation to exchange ideas on other similar practices that you may be a part of or how you could create something similar in your organization and sector. It's now time for us to turn our conversation to the Q&A session, where your participation will be needed. Please now move from the chat box and submit your questions into the Q&A box while I get us started with a few questions. Let me start with you, Sarah. How is TBB's model distinct or different from traditional resettlement pathways? And why do you think this hasn't been tried before? Sure, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, as many of you probably know, there have been only three solutions for refugees. One is to voluntarily repatriate, to go back home. Um, but as you know, some of these conflicts globally are extending for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So that's not an option for, for very many. Um, the second option is local integration. Um, basically integrating to the, in the country to which they fled. Um, but that's a challenge because you've got millions of refugees living, for example, in Lebanon, Jordan, where, and they can't work legally, so they're dependent on aid. Um, and then you have the traditional resettlement pathway, um, like to Canada and, and many other countries, but that's for less than 1% of refugees. 
So, you know, and that targets the most vulnerable, but there are many other refugees who have talents and skills and, and could move for work. So it, basically for the last 65 years, these have been the, the options, um, and it's only now that there's really widespread recognition that there must be other solutions to this crisis. Um, just two, two more points on that. We are very much involved in the Global Forum on Migration and Development. Um, we're playing a role there, and that's a global forum for businesses, UN agencies, governments, and many others to discuss um, the challenges of migration and development. Um, so there's increasing recognition that, that we need to work together to solve um, these refugee and migrant crises. Um, and also, just today, this afternoon, I'm going to a meeting at the U.S. State Department with governments, including representatives from, from the Canadian government um, and many others, to discuss how do we globally start to work on increasing these additional complementary pathways for refugees. So we're encouraged by all the energy around this issue. That's fantastic and very encouraging uh, indeed when you have all the different stakeholders participating in these kind of conversations. So Abigail, from the employer perspective, what do you think are some of the major challenges when you're speaking with employers and trying to get employers on board with this innovative recruitment strategy? And what are some of the solutions or pathways to solutions that you've experienced in, in your work with employers? Um, well, for sure, the, the, the greatest barrier uh, is the immigration process itself. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't built to work for the construction industry. Um, our industry is very cyclical. Uh, typically, uh, when an when employer realizes he's got a shortage and needs workers, um, he needs them really quickly. Um, that's not the way the immigration process works. So, um, you know, the solutions to that, uh, other than completely reconstructing the immigration process, is to do your homework. Um, make sure you've got a good employer, number one, that, that definitely can't fill his position with a Canadian, uh, who's prepared to wait to get that skilled worker, and is prepared to, to basically support those folks in British Columbia, the local workers, so that when they bring in somebody from offshore, they're able to take on more uh, laborers, more apprentices, and we can build a Canadian workforce uh, here at home as well. So it's got you've got to connect the dots, you've got to do your homework, and you've got to be prepared. You've got to have an employer who's prepared to go the extra mile. Excellent. That's great. And so that really leads in nicely. And so Sarah and Abigail, um, maybe either one of you can speak to this. Um, a question from Erica. Um, wondering what kind of assistance beyond um, the employment aspect in terms of resettling in BC, um, so in regards to housing, transportation, um, and you mentioned the challenges with language training and language acquisition. Um, are there other um, resettlement support services that are built in when you um, recruit and bring over refugees to fill some of these skills shortages and skills gaps? Well, I'll take a stab at that one, um, uh, although, again, uh, we're representing employers. Uh, typically, if somebody's uh, recruiting offshore, it depends on the employer what kind of supports they offer as far as relocation, and, and, and it depends on the type of uh, immigration process they're using. If we're talking about bringing folks in across Canada, again, um, you're going to, it depends on the employer, it depends on uh, how, uh, how badly he needs those workers, um, whether he would put up, he or she would put up any funds for, for relocation and so forth. Um, typically in the industry, if we're talking about laboring positions, like entry level, there wouldn't be anything uh, available for relocation from the employer side of it. There may be some government support, um, but I, I can't speak to that specifically. Okay, great. Thank you. Abigail. Yeah, thank you. Um, for refugee support services once they've arrived in BC or other parts of Canada, there are quite a lot of different um, nonprofits and other organizations who are providing various services, help uh, finding housing, getting children enrolled in school, and much, much more. So part of our work at Talent Beyond Boundaries 
is to connect refugees who arrive through skilled migration pathways to those, those resources. Um, and just another point about labor migration, if refugees can arrive and start with a job, that helps tremendously with faster integration into their new home. Absolutely, that's an excellent point. Um, another question from one of our participants, Wafa. He's wondering um, if you've thought about hiring refugees to do online positions in a host community, so working um, maybe remotely for an online project. Is that something that has been uh, thought about or addressed or um, looked at at all? Sarah, maybe you can, you're working with the IT folks. I mean, it's not, in the construction industry, typically you need the individuals at the project. Um, but obviously the IT uh, employers might think differently. Sarah? Um, that's, a, that's a great question, Wafa. Thanks, thanks for asking that. Uh, there are groups who are trying to do that. Um, I, I can even put you in touch if you reach out to me directly about who's doing that in the, the Middle East region with refugees. So that's an important role as well. There are many ways to address this, this big challenge, um, the refugee crisis. Um, but what we found was that one hugely important factor is to get people out of those countries where, where their jobs are so few and their long-term prospects for integration are very limited. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. From Sukhjit, he's wondering if there's any um, recommendations or if you know of any success in the construction industry in Ontario with a similar, um, you know, filling similar labor shortages or labor gaps um, and how this model that has been successful in BC can be replicated here in the Ontario construction industry. So, um, you know, it depends again on the actual market, how, how hot it is and how busy and how many job openings there are in Ontario. Um, there are certainly uh, sister organizations in Ontario to the BC Construction Association. So there are construction uh, associations in Toronto, in Ottawa, and of course the Canadian Construction Association is also situated in Ontario in Ottawa. Um, now, whether those associations are as active as BCCA is with regards to filling skill shortages, I, I can't speak to. But I would highly recommend any group, any, any uh, immigrant serving agency that, that's working with refugees or helping to bring people in, that they do connect with those associations because you get a really different perspective when you, you know, a lot of folks work with the supply side of it, but not so much with the demand side. And if you, if you can make those connections with the demand side, that's when things start to work, because you're filling actual openings and you're working with, with folks who see it from a slightly different perspective. Fantastic. Thank you, Abigail. Another question for you, Abigail, from Basel. He's wondering, for the bilingual individuals who are working with Arabic-speaking construction teams, are they working in supervisory capacities or simply as colleagues who are able to help with translation? And are the safety materials translated for these teams that may have uh, challenges with English proficiency? Right. So uh, the answer to that is, uh, both um, supervisory and colleagues. Um, we did a, a recent project working um, with the Roofing uh, Association, um, one of the immigrant serving agencies here on Vancouver Island. Um, identified, uh, we identified a, a roofer, a prominent roofer, um, who actually hired, uh, put, put about 15 Syrian refugees through a um, two-week intensive safety course and, and, and a bit of you know, foundation work uh, to get them ready to go to work as roofers. And we had a, a bilingual fellow who works with us who was present uh, throughout the two weeks to also help with the instruction. And, and he can report back that it was highly focused on safety, as you can imagine, with roofing, that's pretty important. And, and he took, you know, he took a lot of time making sure that, that these folks who were taking this program 
truly understood the safety aspects of the job. So it's, it's very important, trust me, uh, for employers to make sure that anybody they hire is, has got the safety elements down cold because they don't want any problems uh, going forward. So the bilingual folks are both on the job and they're also involved in the training uh, prior to going on the job. Perfect, thank you for that, Abigail. Um, Sarah, this is a question from you from Dana. Does the talent catalog meet construction industry needs specifically, or are there other targeted areas? The area in which um, Dana is writing from is southern Manitoba, and they're in need of manufacturing workers in all types of manufacturing industries. Thanks so much for that question. Absolutely. Um, now we have 6,000 people registered in our talent catalog, and there are over 100 different um, professions and, and skilled trades in that talent catalog. So we have a lot of people with manufacturing experience um, and would love, love to connect you or talk to you about potentially exploring hiring those candidates. Excellent. Thanks, there. And, and just a note from uh, one of our organizations that Hire Immigrants works closely with is Access Employment, and they're currently working uh, with Layuna, a masonry training center and language trainers and settlement partners to prepare Syrian newcomers for construction-related work. And then I know that uh, Allison would love to connect with uh, you, Sarah, and you, Abigail, as well, um, to look at that model in BC and see how it translates in the Ontario context. So thank you, Allison. And so as we wait for additional questions from some of our participants, um, I'd like to kind of ask a question from here at Hire Immigrants. Um, in terms of, uh, based on this partnership model, what do you think are the key factors for employers to consider when they're thinking of developing a, a similar employment program? And I know, Abigail, you've spoken to that over a few different questions. Um, but when it comes to serving refugee populations and um, bringing them into the workforce here in Canada, what do you think are some things that employers need to consider before perhaps reaching out to you, Sarah, at TVB? Thanks. So just to start off, I mean, Abigail mentioned that um, to hire refugees, you might have to go the extra mile. And I have to say, Abigail goes beyond the extra mile. She has been just extremely helpful working with us and starting this in British Columbia. So thank you, Abigail. Um, and you know, I think employers need to consider that this process, of course, takes time. Um, once a company, a business is interested in a candidate, it can still take quite a few months, maybe six months, even, even longer, before that person will get to Canada. So our model at Talent Beyond Boundaries, it's best for companies that have a sustained need um, to hire for certain positions. Um, also, just to mention, of course, nonprofits who are already working in Canada, um, we'd love to talk with them about helping um, refugees before they even arrive in Canada with certain training in uh, skilled industries um, so we can make sure that the candidate is, is successful once they land and start working. Um, finally, you know, if a, we're exploring different immigration models, including the private sponsorship. So if an organization has that sponsorship agreement holder, they could privately sponsor candidates that employers are interested in. Um, so there's quite a few ways that we can work together um, uh, on this project. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. I, I would just, I would just, uh, yeah, I would just add to that. Um, really important to make sure that um, before an employer even gets rolling, they need to understand uh, the immigration process, what that means, and they need to be certain that there aren't Canadians available to fill the job. Um, it's you can't just decide uh, out of the goodness of your heart to bring folks in uh, through the immigration process uh, unless you want to get involved in private sponsorship and so forth. You, you really need to, there needs to be that demand. Um, and, and again, that brings me back to why it's so important for the, the employer side to speak with the supply side um, so that we can connect the dots properly. Perfect. And Abigail, that leads nicely into a question we have from Gabriella. 
who's wondering, and, and again, Abigail and Sarah, um, both of you may be able to respond to this as well. Um, if you've experienced any resistance from employers, um, from the employer side of this uh, model, in terms of adopting uh, the idea to fill gaps with refugee talent, with refugee uh, newcomer talent. So I'll speak uh, for first. Um, from the, again, I'm speaking from the perspective of the construction industry. I think you'll find in Canada that uh, uh, the, the industry was developed through immigration. Um, right from the early days of Canada, the construction industry has always been filled with new immigrants. Uh, and I, for the most part, um, you'll find that companies and employers are welcoming. Um, if they, they're looking for talent, they're not looking at um, the background of that individual other than the experience and the education that they have. So for the most part, I would say the construction industry is very welcoming uh, of immigrants into the workforce. At Talent Beyond Boundaries, we, we have an entire corporate outreach team. And we initially thought we'd need to um, do a lot of convincing to businesses. So we were pulling together all the various research about the high retention rates of refugees in, in various countries, um, success stories. But what we found is companies are coming to us and saying, no, this makes total sense. Um, obviously, they have skills and talents. We need to fill jobs. They're dedicated workers, eager to learn, share their experience. Companies want to diversify their workforce. So, so, so far, we're hearing uh, really positive things from the companies we're talking with. And, and I'll just add, one of, one of the most important things for, for an employer when they're looking to hire somebody offshore is a really good assessment. So they, want, they need to trust that, the, that somebody has done some prior work and, and assessed their skill sets. And, and I'll have to say again, uh, Talent Beyond Boundaries does an excellent job of that. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah and Abigail. Um, and so this leads nicely into a question from Marsha, who's wondering, if a refugee is already in Canada, she's asking specifically about Ontario, does TBB assist in any way? Thanks, Marsha. Um, there are organizations across Canada who are helping to connect refugees with jobs. So we, did, we didn't want to recreate the, the wheel. Um, we are only working on um, labor mobility for refugees to move for global employment opportunities. Excellent. That's a great uh, qualifying factor. Um, and a question from Paula. What has been your success, and again, uh, I'll feed to uh, Abigail or Sarah on this, um, success with LMIAs here in Canada? So um, LMIAs, uh, I'm not going to get into uh, comments about our immigration process. As I already said, it doesn't work well for for the construction industry because of timing. Um, there are always challenges uh, around getting the permissions, basically, to bring people in offshore. And for the construction industry, the number one challenge is always timing. So nothing's ever fast enough. Perfect. Thank you, Abigail. Um, and Sarah, anything to add with your experience? Um, again, because you work not just here in Canada, but in other areas with the immigration system. Is it really just about the more information, the more knowledgeable employers are, the more and higher success rate you can have with bringing over refugee talent? So um, there are, as we mentioned, you know, many different challenges to bringing in refugee talent. Um, the immigration pathways for Canada are different from Australia and different from Morocco and other countries. Um, so what we, what we need to do is work together. I mean, we, the, the companies, businesses have an idea of what their needs are. Um, there are institutions that have the labor market um, data that's needed so we can look at projected labor needs, um, since this does take a long time to get through the immigration process. But we're really committed to, to working with companies as, as a true partner um, to make sure that this can go as smoothly as possible, given that it is a, a new pathway. Um, one other thing I just wanted to add, um, if some of you employers have immediate 
job needs uh, that you need to address. There's the um, Immigrant Employment Council of British Columbia, IECBC, and they're doing a, a similar program to ours, but with refugees who are already resettled in British Columbia. Um, they have a website that employers can search immediately, and they focus on manual workers, but a lot of their candidates are skilled trades workers, highly educated. We saw one candidate with a bachelor's, a master's, and a, a PhD. Um, but just in conclusion, you know, please do contact us if you have international hiring needs, and we'd love to explore how we could pot potentially work together. Thanks. And so, Sarah, that neat leads nicely into another question around um, identifying the industries with which TBB works with. Um, so is it usually um, employers approach or industries approach TBB, or do you um, kind of scan to see where uh, labor shortages is, where labor gaps are, um, and kind of go out and vet invitations to employers to engage in this process? Um, thanks for that question. So we started by looking at where are the labor needs in different parts of the world, um, countries, different regions within certain countries. But what we found is that it's much easier if um, companies reach out to us or a, a connection is facilitated between us and a company that's interested because it shows that they're already exploring um, this option, they're interested in engaging in a global solution, they need to find the skilled talent from um, abroad. So if, if any of you have um, knowledge, whether it's in your business or within your specific industry about hiring needs, um, please do let us know. We'd love to connect. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah. And so there does seem to be a lot of interest on the chat box and in the Q&A box to get in touch with both you, Sarah, as well as yourself, Abigail. And so um, thank you for providing your contact information, and we hope that, um, that you'll receive lots of positive response from our participants. And um, before we wrap up uh, the webinar, one last kind of question to both uh, uh, you, Abigail, and you, Sarah. What advice would you give to those listening in today who are looking for solutions to solving their labor market shortages by employing refugees? Any kind of last comments and advice for our, for our participants listening in? Uh, my advice to everybody, and I'm, and I'm not entirely sure who all's on the line or listening, is talk to each other. Um, try to create a, an opportunity for if you're in employment uh, group or if you're a immigrant serving agency to sit down and talk about um, what demand is out there and who's available. And once you figure that out, the rest of it's not rocket science, um, but there needs to be really good communication and good networking between demand and supply. I would second that. Um, we have throughout our work with employers as well as on the ground working with refugee organizations in Lebanon and Jordan. We're working through a lot of different partnerships. Um, there's various expertise that's needed for, to make this successful and to bring in people through immigration routes. So agreed, talk to each other. Please do contact us and, and work in partnership on this. All right, perfect. Thank you, Sarah and Abigail and all of our participants listening in. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but thank you for an engaging Q&A and answering all of our participants' questions. I certainly foresee there being follow-up emails to both of you with our um, participants that have been uh, requesting your contact information. So on behalf of all of our participants, the Higher Immigrants team, and the Ontario government, our sponsor, I'd like to thank Abigail Fulton and Sarah Nice for an informative session and exchange of ideas, as well as for the practical tips and solutions that they presented us. Thank you very much. Once the webinar recording and downloadable resources are available, all of our participants will be notified via email. These resources will be made available at www.hireimmigrants.org. So please bookmark the page and share it with your colleagues and networks. To our audience in Canada and beyond, please stay connected. Finally, before I let you go, our team values your feedback, and we'd like to hear your thoughts on today's session. So please complete our online evaluation by clicking the link on your screen or in your email. It only takes a few minutes, but your feedback truly does help us with content development. That's it for our webinar today. Goodbye, everyone.